The League of Nations was the money cartel's first attempt at world control, but Tsar Nicholas II of Russia caught on to their plot and sabotaged it. That proved to be a deadly mistake. Schiff, Warburg, Rockefeller, Harriman, and Morgan backed the uprisings that led to the 1917 Russian Revolution. Their strategy was to finance both sides of wars and revolutions, which gave them control over the winners, the losers, and the outcome. Between 1918 and 1921, 14 million Russians died from war and starvation under Lenin's Bolsheviks. By 1919, Lenin ran up a national debt to the Rothschild banksters of $60 billion, which put Russia firmly under their control. As Mayor Rothschild once said, give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes her laws. To this day, the Rothschilds have stopped the heirs to the Tsar's fortunes from claiming their deposits held in Rothschild banks. Those fortunes are now worth an estimated $50 billion. Joseph Stalin, who was financed by the same money cartel, replaced Lenin as Russia's brutal new dictator. Using terror and death threats, Stalin's job was to industrialize Russia and turn communism into a powerful counterforce to democracy. Manufactured conflicts between these two powerful political forces would be the ideal excuse for all future wars and for dividing, conquering, and ruling the world. But profits were not the only motive. There was also revenge. The money changers never forgave the Tsars for their support of Lincoln during the Civil War. Also, Russia was the last major European nation to refuse to give in to the privately owned central bank scheme. Three years after World War I broke out, the Russian Revolution toppled the Tsar and installed the scourge of communism. Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb and Company bragged from his deathbed that he had spent $20 million towards the defeat of the Tsar. Money was funneled from England to support the revolution as well. Why would some of the richest men in the world financially back communism, the system that was openly vowing to destroy the so-called capitalism that made them wealthy? Researcher Gary Allen explained it this way. If one understands that socialism is not a share of the wealth program, but is, in reality, a method to consolidate and control the wealth, then the seeming paradox of super-rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead, it becomes logical, even the perfect tool of power-seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but of the economic elite. As W. Cleon Skousen put it in his 1970 book, The Naked Capitalist, Power from any source tends to create an appetite for additional power. It was almost inevitable that the super-rich would one day aspire to control not only their own wealth, but the wealth of the whole world. To achieve this, they were perfectly willing to feed the ambitions of the power-hungry political conspirators who were committed to the overthrow of all existing governments and the establishments of a central worldwide dictatorship. But what if these revolutionaries get out of control and try to seize power from the super-rich? After all, it was Mao Tse-Tung who in 1938 stated his position concerning power. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The Wall Street, London Axis elected to take the risk. The master planners attempted to control revolutionary communist groups by feeding them vast quantities of money when they obeyed and contracting their money supply or even financing their opposition if they got out of control. Lenin began to understand that although he was the absolute dictator of the new Soviet Union, he was not pulling the financial strings. Someone else was silently in control. The state does not function as we desired. The car does not obey. A man is at the wheel and seems to lead it, but the car does not drive in the desired direction. It moves as another force wishes.